Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to the third lecture of uh, Images, Imaginations and Cultures. This lecture is titled Visual Culture and Critical Theory. In the previous two lectures, in the introduction and uh, in the second lecture, we have looked at um, the idea of images, what, comp com what comprises images, um, the idea of imagination, uh, how do we understand, uh, you know, this conceptualization of imaginations and what are the various attributes um, from cultural contexts that influence, inflect um, images uh, across the world. So, uh, in this lecture, uh, what we will be looking at is um, some key theorists um, who have, you know, shed their important light on the study of images. But at this point, uh, you know, so, so we are going to look at Michel Foucault's uh, theoretical orientation contributions uh, towards um, images. Um, so Foucault was a French historian and a philosopher and was associated with the structuralist and post-structuralist um, movements. Um, the second theorist we are going to look at um, is uh, Lacan, um, who has contributed enormously to the history of psychoanalysis. The third theorist um, who will be who we will be looking at is uh, Derrida, and uh, if you are familiar with Derrida's work, you would be familiar with the with his conceptualization of deconstruction, which is a way of criticizing not only both literary and philosophical text, but also political institutions. And uh, the fourth theorist who we will be looking at is Roland Barthes, uh, who was a a French essayist and a social and literary critic whose writings on semiotics, the formal study of symbols and signs pioneered by um, Saussure. So, he was inspired by Saussure's uh, work on uh, semiotics and uh, built on Saussure's work. So, these are the four key uh, critical theorists we are going to look at in our understanding of um, the image, but at this point, um, it is also important to note that, uh, you know, none of these theorists that you see on the screen um, is directly concerned with the visual. That is, um, none of them would call uh, themselves, you know, trained in visual arts. So, visual, the visual, visual arts um, was not really the center, the central purpose of their critical theories. But uh, what we do see is that in their works, in the ideas that they have professed, um, they have had a you know, fundamental, a very major impact on the development of uh, the discipline of visual culture and visual cultural studies. So, we, we do see that as visual cultural studies evolve and we talked about um, in the second lecture also that, uh, you know, there are these facets, aspects of the development of visual cultural studies and, you know, those evolution, those processes were heavily influenced by the works, by the theoretical uh, uh, proposals uh, put forward by these theorists. So, um, and, and in turn, um, uh, you know, images, the visual turn uh, also has influenced uh, many of the theorization uh, proposed by these uh, scholars. So, it has really been a two-way um, relationship. And, um, you know, at the same time, we do see that, uh, you know, these theorists, uh, you know, they do not set out um, at the very start to develop a theory of images, uh, you know, possibly that would not come across as the fundamental purpose of their theorization, but um, would it, we, would, we do see that um, their ideas, their, uh, you know, philosophies have been instrumental in shaping contemporary debates on images. And uh, what is most significant perhaps in this context is that 
um, the visual, the you know, the visual turn, the visual has proven to be an essential part of their theorizing. So, whether we are talking about Foucault, whether we are talking about Lacan or Derrida or Barthes, the image um, or the visual has um, has sort of implicitly uh, being part of their uh, theorization process. So, um, let us start with uh, Foucault's ideas uh, as they connect to the image. And um, the first, the very first, um, you know, position that we uh, can start with talking about image and Foucault, um, of course, is the idea of power. Now, if you are familiar with Foucault's uh, works on power, you would be able to identify with this better. Um, if you are not, I encourage you to read, um, you know, some of Foucault's work on power um, and uh, relate this with the study of images. So, so the, the first question here is then why power? You know, why do we need to talk about power? And, um, and, and what is it that the relationship of power and the image has um, to offer? So, um, when we look at images, um, are we really interacting with relations of power? And this takes us back to our, um, you know, conversations uh, in the second lecture that we had with regard to spectatorship and, uh, you know, the image, uh, the relationship between the viewer um, and the viewed. So, um, so, you know, if we bring in the question of power as proposed by Foucault, um, you know, Ha, you know, the question is when we are looking at an image, are we just looking at that image or are we looking at the image with a purpose or are we looking at the image um, to negotiate some sort of, uh, you know, a power play. And, um, you know, for example, when um, you walk into an art gallery or you, you know, open a magazine and look at an image and or, or you open a book and look at an image. Um, you know, or even photographs that, uh, you know, you, ha you have collected over the years, um, you know, what sort of investments of power are we engaging in? Is, is, that, is, is that the central part of Foucault's um, idea um, of connecting power and uh, the image? So, for Foucault, um, you know, the moment you are looking at an image, um, you know, that is a change that changes you as a human being to you as the spectator. So, the very fact that you are looking at an image is a transformation in itself for yourself as the viewer also and that according to Foucault um, is a power dynamic. So, what, um, what Foucault would propose power to be here is that power has been a means to an end and, and he has talked about this in various contexts uh, throughout his, um, you know, philosophical tenure um, and in this case also it is no different. So, in the case of images, uh, Foucault would talk about power, the, the question of power as means to an end and, um, you know, he, he was not really, you know, interested much uh, in analyzing or critiquing, um, you know, the nature of power, but as he would say that he was interested that how power becomes a vehicle um, for the subject, for the viewer or the viewed, um, more specifically, um, you know, in the construction of human beings and their translation into subjects. So, that was uh, what Foucault was interested in um, with regard to power and, and its relationship with image. So, what he would say um, is that power was, you know, sort of only activated, um, you know, power would start its negotiation process once a power relationship had been constructed and engaged with. And, um, you know, he, and I quote Foucault here, um, that my objective, Foucault is saying, my objective um, has been to create a history of different modes by which in our culture human beings are made subjects. 
My work has dealt with three modes of objectification which transform human beings into subject. So, this transformation of human beings into subjects through the vehicle of how we understand power is something that Foucault's idea of power is invested in. That uh, you know they, they produce certain forms of subjectivity, they produce certain forms of viewership and that brings in um, you know more symbolic meaning for the images that we look at. So, um, building on this idea of uh, you know the power image and uh, the subject that Foucault uh, you know has sort of established the fact that you know the viewer and the viewed this procedure actually transforms the human beings into a subject and in this process you know power is negotiated uh, um, in, in, in various forms. So, um, and you know because power is negotiated in various forms, um, the nature of subjectivity also uh, changes. So, and this nature of subjectivity gives rise to um, you know a network of uh, economy of power relations um, and that gives rise to various power geometries as we have talked about in the first two lectures. So, so the uh, bottom line here is that uh, you know many of these scholars who have used uh, the concept of power um, and, and taken it to the study of images, um, you know they try to find out what power relations are involved in visual cultures and they, they look at various oppositions, um, you know they look at various resistances of power and uh, you know they make meaning of the various subjectivities uh, that comprise power relations. So, when I talk of subjectivities, I am also talking about agency. I am talking about uh, you know the, the actionable uh, capabilities or not of, of human beings in a particular uh, episode. So, that tells us uh, uh, more about the type of power relationships. Um, that has been practiced uh, in, in this context. So, um, and, and what is important here is that um, you know beyond um, a critical theoretical angle, it also brings in a question of methodology. It also brings in a methodological intervention and it gives us a fundamental lens um, to see how power is actually practiced in this relationship. So, if you have an image and if you are looking at an image and uh, you know that, that viewing has an agenda and there is a power dynamic that is at play, uh, how is it that this power is practiced in that viewer viewing relationship. So, um, so as a result as you can imagine uh, you know in this negotiation in this net network of negotiations um, there would be various forms of power um, with regard to various forms of images and there would be various forms of subjectivities coming out um, you know from that network. So, um, just to put another layer of critical inquiry to the question of uh, the subject. So, Foucault now talks about uh, you know the relationship between power, image and the spectating subject. So, what he is now bringing in to the conversation is that um, you know the act of spectatorship and spectatorship is something we have dealt with um, in the second lecture also in details and I will use an example here um, to actually build on um, this concept. So, you know um, many scholars have actually used this example in their work. Um, it is the example of uh, the um, painting of Mona Lisa uh, that's, that we find in uh, the Louvre Museum, um, Da Vinci's uh, Mona Lisa. So, um, you know 
what we what we know of the painting, what we know of Mona Lisa, is that um, it is one of the uh, you know crowd pulling sort of images or paintings. You know that people go there um, to see, to watch, to cherish, um, and and you know it, that bringing that example to the forefront. Um, you know, several scholars um, who have used Foucault in their work um, and looked at image dynamics have asked this question that why does Mona Lisa attract the crowd? That what is it about the painting that, um, you know, that pulls in a lot of uh, spectatorship? And they have put forward several questions, um, you know, several assumptions that, um, you know, is it a crowd puller because uh, it is best, it is one of the best, best painted, um, you know, pieces of art? Or is it because, um, you know, it, it's, it's aesthetically pleasing? Or uh, because, um, you know, as an image, Mona Lisa is culturally recognized as a piece of art. So, you know, they have, you know, scholars from various, um, you know, aspects across the globe who have used Foucault here um, have dealt with these questions to find out what is it about a painting um, that actually draws in a lot of spectatorship. And um, so what they have come to a consensus uh, is that, um, you know, Mona Lisa, you know, the piece of painting, um, you know, is, is a highly valued object, is a highly valued image. And, um, and here the power is exercised by the image um, and it invokes a desire within the subject to become a part of the privilege of knowledge of that image. So that is the function that Mona Lisa's, um, you know, the artwork is performing, that it is pulling in the crowd for, it's pulling in a spectatorship that, um, you know, invokes a desire within the viewer, invokes a desire within the group, uh, you know, or, who, or, or the uh, spectating subject that, um, you know, with, with a desire to become part of a privileged body of knowledge uh, with regard to that image. So, you know, in that case, uh, you know, there's something else that is also happening. And here, um, you know, I'm bringing in all the conceptual frameworks I've talked to so far here. One is the imagination work from the GGP framework we talked about in the first lecture. Um, the idea of boundary work that we talked about in the first lecture and you know bringing in those lenses to see that um, you know just the viewing of a highly valued object the viewing of a highly valued object across the world is is helping us you know in an imagination work to form sort of a boundary so that um, you know we can identify with a community, um, you know, a, a privileged community or or, or, or a community or, or a privileged body of um, you know knowledge ownership, and so uh, you know there is a very subtle way of um, I won't say class construction, but there is a very subtle way of, uh, you know, group dynamic, a very subtle way of boundary work that is going on behind, um, you know, uh, behind viewing of the Mona Lisa and many such highly valued art objects uh, like Mona Lisa. So, so then uh, viewing of Mona Lisa becomes about uh, the act of viewing and being included in a cultural moment rather than viewing Mona Lisa as a singular piece of everyday art. So what is also happening is that viewing is also um, sort of placed in a cultural moment. So, you know, it is giving birth to a cultural moment um, that, you know, uh, I or you or somebody else have actually gone to Louvre Museum and have have looked at, have seen um, the original um, uh, work of art. And that is very important for us to acknowledge, um, you know, here uh, when we are talking about power image and the spectating uh, subject is that, you know, how that viewership, how that viewership is changing human beings into subjects and, um, you know, what sort of a power negotiation is going on um, in this transition. Um, 
So, here I would also pause for a second and um, ask you this question that um, you know again going back to the question of living in the digital age that um, you know to make an effort to go to Louvre Museum and to look at the original piece of art um, you know um, Mona Lisa versus um, you know to look at uh, the same artwork online on the internet digitally right. So, in both cases um, you know there is this action of spectatorship, but do you think that the power negotiation in both the cases would be same or do you think that the power negotiation the, the um, creation of the spectating subject would be different if you are looking at the piece of um, painting in person versus if you are looking at it um, on the internet or a digital version of it. So, this is a question for you to think of about and um, you know whatever you arrive at an answer to this question is you know the form of power negotiation, the form of um, sort of boundary work, the form of function that images are performing with this respect um, between the viewer and the viewed, between the viewer and um, the uh, spectator, the viewed and the spectator. So, um, for Foucault um, power um, is produced, managed and organized by various socio cultural discourses and you know these discourses um, you know influence how in social institutions function. So, and, and in this case um, the idea of power, the idea of um, um, uh, of the spectating subject um, you know creates this sort of um, uh, this sort of uh, you know discourse that um, you know power as a vehicle um, you know in this case um, would be a discourse that would influence cultural processes that would influence um, you know social institutions. So, I mean this would probably answer a lot of questions that you may have with regard to you know why we go to an art gallery to look at you know original piece of art. Why do we uh, you know uh, read a book and then watch uh, a, a film and then you know how does the viewership the readership and the viewership of uh, between the two um, you know are different. So, these are questions that you need to ask yourself um, with regard to uh, Foucault's idea of power image and the spectating um, subject. Um, and then um, Foucault uh, also identifies in this process, um, Foucault identifies three types of struggle and um, you know this, uh, this sort of struggles um, you know the underlying current being power negotiation um, would be against domination, exploitation and um, subjection. And um, you know while he does not really uh, relate these forms of power struggle specifically to the image, they are still uh, concerned with the discourse of the subject and the creation of subjectivity. So, as we understand uh, you know, the, 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 the practices of domination, the practices of exploitation and subjection um, would, would go a long way um, to influence the discourse of the subject. So, um, so, scholars have you know involved such 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 type of a discourse and its structure um, to examine how the subject views and interacts with the image um, you know uh, with various forms of image. And um, you know this is again um, just to remind you when Foucault devised um, these theoretical frameworks he was not really thinking uh, of images um, you know exceptionally he was not really thinking of images front and center, but this is an overarching sort of a philosophy overarching sort of a framework a lens um, that Foucault provides us that we find helpful you know scholars working in this area find helpful um, to understand make meaning of um, you know how we understand power dynamics um, you know with regard to um, um, images. So, um, and uh, I mean the, the, 
The part here is that Foucault and I also talked about it in the previous um, slide is that the idea of power as a methodological component, the idea of power as praxis, the idea of power as being enacted. So, um, you know, um, why would you go to, um, you know, again, um, you know, a cinema hall, a movie theater to watch a film? Why would you go to an art gallery um, to watch, you know, works of art? So, this why. Um, is a question of um, you know that relates visual culture with social institutions, and um, and what they uh, what what scholars find is that you know these power dynamics, these power struggles, um, you know they not only help to establish and consolidate a sense of subjectivity, they also wrestle with any order that assists uh, you know uh, the individual. So. For example, um, you know, if uh, if if uh, you know, it's it's not really about establishing. Also, it's also about negotiations, and um, you know, the, and this is just uh, you know summing up Foucault's ideas that um, you know we can use uh, his notion of power um, to mark the shift in subjectivity from an uncritical um, and unaware sort of a spectating position. To a more um, conscious, um, you know, self-reflexive position um, when we are talking about an image. So this is the journey um, that power um, and Foucault, Foucault's idea of power, is helping us establish. Is that um, you know the journey of uh, looking at an image as a viewer, as a human being, um, to the journey of um, you know looking at the image as a subject. And what is that translation? What is that transition doing for us, um, those who are looking at the image, um, is a question of power dynamic, is a question of power negotiation as, um, as Foucault would identify with. So um, with this, let me also now transition to the next uh, philosopher who again uh, you know have not been talking about image uh, particularly uh, but the ideas um, you know put forward uh, lacan in this case um, you know help us get an advantageous or vantage point to understand and study images so the first thing uh, that uh, we would be looking at is the relationship between speech language and the image um, and you know uh, Lacan was uh, profoundly influenced by the visual and um, you know although he did not make direct reference to the visual in his work um, you know he he did uh, th there's a lot of uh, you know studies that have shown us that um, you know there has been a lot of influence um, of images in his um, work so um, in Lacan's theory, um, if you are familiar with it, um, again we are also dealing with the formation of subjectivity, like we were looking at um, in the case of Foucault's ideas, um, that uh, you know the formation of subjectivity, the operation of the unconscious, um, and the processes of desire. So um, you know if you if you now take these sets of framework. Um, to a number of different sets of images, um, you know, including painting, including um, you know cinema, and including probably the mirror. You know, when you stand in front of the mirror, um, you know, you do see an image, and um, and so um, one idea that comes out from Lacan's um, theoretical framework is that how um, Lacan explores the reflexivity of the self, and um, you know, many social scientists, many sociologists have actually uh, looked at this reflexivity of the um, self. Uh, for example, Cooley's work um, on uh, you know uh, the reflexivity of the self also, um, and in doing so, uh, and this is Lacan saying, locating the theme of the mirror as an integral part of formation of the subject. So really, um, as you can imagine, um, from Foucault to Lacan, um, in in this respect, 
we are also talking about a change of scale. We are lo looking at uh, you know very different scales um, with regard to the image. So in 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 the case of Foucault, we were talking about you know power dynamics and possibly you know um, at a at a uh, meso or macro level power dynamic, uh, but uh, for for the case of Lacan and you know talking about the uh, you know mirror and the image that the mirror produces, uh, we are looking at a very different uh, micro level uh, scale. So um, uh, the visual uh, has been an ongoing part of questioning assertion, collapse, and uh, strengthening of subjectivity for um, you know in, in the case of Lacan's um, ideas. Um, so just to build on a little bit on uh, the metaphoricity of the mirror as Lacan would uh, you know coin it. Um, so what Lacan would say and remember we are talking about uh, you know speech and language um, also here is that the mirror um, was both an intellectual pursuit and a personal obsession. And this is Lacan's, um, you know, coming from Lacan's idea. And it was an instrument for analysis and a process of forming subjectivities. So it's interesting to note that, um, you know, I use the example of Mona Lisa uh, to explain Foucault's uh, idea of power. Um, so the image form um, in the case of Foucault was very different than the image form um, than w that we are talking about for Lacan. So what we talked about an art form, um, you know, uh, 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 globally acclaimed, um, um, you know, highly valued art form for Foucault's example, we are talking about, uh, you know, a very different form of um, an image here, an image that is produced by the mirror, and um, but but the but the constant here for Foucault and Lacan is the process of forming subjectivities. So you are, in a way, um, you know, sort of transformed into um, a subject from an uncritical uh, viewer, uncritical human being. Um, and um, you know Lacan's ideas here are helpful um, because they sort of demonstrate an awareness of the impossibility of the usual construction of time within the unconscious. And he's going to a very different philosophical level here that uh, you know time actually constitutes a paradigm. He's bringing in the question of time, um, which allows us to see a difference between what we imagine and what we symbolize and uh, particularly they are experienced through the process of um, subjectivity. So the idea of imagination work, um, the journey from imagination work to actually um, you know establishing a symbolic meaning is, uh, is a journey through time as Lacan would say. and. Um, in this process, it is experienced through the process of uh, subjectivity, um, and that is what uh, Lacan is arguing here. So, um, you know, as uh, if we have to contrast uh, Lacan's work with Foucault uh, that we have just seen, is that we are talking about two different, uh, you know, scales of approach, um, but we are we are you know simultaneously at the same time looking at, you know, a key concept that is creation of subjectivity. And of course, um, you know, when we are talking about subjectivity, I am also talking about power and agency. So power and agency, you know, has been constant um, in this discussion. Um, and for Lacan, as we see, uh, you know, time also becomes an important element. Moving on to the third um, um, philosopher, the third uh, critical theorist uh, who has, uh, you know, given us a very important uh, uh, framework, who has given us, uh, you know, an aperture to look at images in a, in a very critical uh, way um, is uh, Derrida. So uh, he has been the founder of the idea of uh, deconstruction, which uh, as you may be familiar with, 
is a way of criticizing not only literary and philosophical texts, but also political institutions. So, uh, it is interesting to see, uh, you know, how scholars have um, used various aspects of deconstruction um, to the analysis of um, images. And it, it, it is interesting to also see that, uh, you know, the idea of deconstruction, the idea um, of, um, you know, the relationship between um, the image context and the spectator, um, you know, is not a simple one. So, an image, again, going back to the idea of the image, you know, an image just, you know, does not just exist. So, it involves a relationship between image context and the spectator. And, um, of course, at some level, um, the image itself, um, you know, sort of exerts, invests, and um, struggles with a sense of power. So, there is also a sense of power dynamic that is attached to the image itself. And, um, you know, and of course, with that uh, is, is, is sort of entwined the idea of the struggle of interpretation. And, um, you know, this all parts of the framework come from the idea of deconstruction from uh, um, Derrida's uh, work. So, um, so it is interesting if you would like uh, to bring in the idea of deconstruction um, to look at how the various modes of interpretation, um, you know, would change with regard to the various modes of power that is being attached to the image and how the image itself would command, uh, you know, its own uh, network of um, or, or geometry, power geometry of context and spectatorship. So, um, so deconstruction in a way helps us um, uh, to map out the relationship of the image to understanding and interpretation. So, there are two uh, levels I am talking here, um, you know, one is to understand an image and the second level is to interpret that image. And so, these are two processes, they are very much sort of immersed in the process of power. Um, and that is where, uh, you know, Derrida's deconstruction, um, you know, deconstruction's ideas would be helpful to understand images. That, um, and also, uh, you know, in terms of scale, um, Derrida here is really referring to very large scale, um, you know, histories of ideas. So, you know, Derrida, you know, like Foucault is talking to, you know, very large scale operations for, um, you know, social institutions um, and, you know, the global order, global processes that would be influenced by uh, you know, the image and the spectatorship. So, um, uh, uh, deconstruction as a framework, you know, would help us, um, you know, look at these power dynamics. Um, one is that is attached to the image, the other is attached to the spectator, and then the levels of understanding and interpretation as, uh, you know, would be very different and would be a process of, you know, they would be immersed um, in a process of power negotiation. So, deconstruction's um, relationship to the visual um, is, um, you know, has been dealt with by some scholars. And, you know, the question that they ask is that how might, you know, somebody explore deconstruction's relationship um, to the visual. And, um, you know, and, you know, which, uh, the ways in which deconstruction might be used um, to explore the image. Um, and if you are familiar with the, uh, with the framework of deconstruction, um, this would be seeing how, uh, you know, sort of Derrida's systems of techniques of analysis can be used to explore the image from inside out. So, as I was talking about that, you know, the image itself is laden with a power geometry. And, um, you know, that power geometry, uh, you know, gives the image its own status 
um, also. So, for example, um, you know, we talk about a true image, we talk about a sacred image. So, you know, the image, uh, we talk about a digital image. So, the image itself is laden um, with a power geometry within a power geometry and that gives the image um, you know your the, the image uh, its attribute so um, and that is the inside out um, type of an interpretation to look at um, image and using the lens of deconstruction and what is Im, you know important here is that um, the you know, much of the relationship, much of the negotiation between the viewer and the viewed, um, you know, takes outside the image. And, um, you know, that includes the spectator um, and the image. And that also, um, you know, includes the culture of the image. Um, so, you know, the, so again, I'm talking about uh, two different scales here that you know there is an inside out sort of an power geometry and there is an outside of an image sort of a power geometry so you know these give rise to a matrix of visual culture and you know these matrices of visual cultures they formulate various systems of representation so representation is something I have dealt with um, in the introduction also and I will be dealing with uh, in the next lectures in this series. Um, and uh, you know not just repre representation but they also create spaces where these representations are negotiated. So you know what um, you know what uh, Lacan would talk about time, uh, Derrida would talk about space. And um, you know this will give us a lens, a very helpful lens that um, you know will help us understand how uh, a culture defines its visual limits, um, and you know how is it significant as the actual images as it produces. So um, you know when you talk about visual culture in a, in your mind you already have set a boundary you already have a cognitive um, sort of an idea what you are talking about visual culture you know what are the boundaries where the visual culture would start and where it would stop and you know so this ideas of deconstruction goes a long way to help us understand that boundary um, and um, you know it is as significant as the um, you know form of image or, or the type of image uh, or the image itself um, is. Um, so with that I um, transition to um, the next uh, philosopher, the next critical theorist um, who is uh, Roland Barthes. And if he, he was a French essayist um, and social and literary critic whose writings on semiotics, which is a formal study of symbols and signs, um, you know, uh, pioneered by um, Saussure was uh, heavily influential to understanding, um, you know, images. So we do see that, uh, again, Barthes's idea is not coming from, um, you know, images per se that, you know, he is not really talking about, um, you know, images front and center. Um, you know, he, he, he talks more about the text, he talks more about the literary, um, you know, the social and literary part of the text. And, you know, we find that, you know, uh, scholars who have used uh, Bathis in their work on images, um, you know, he is interesting because uh, he is someone who have who has been moving from a strongly linguistic and literary position um, to a more visually driven um, sort of a career in his later years. So we see this transition um, in Bath's uh, you know journey, academic journey, scholarly journey, that um, he is uh, sort of moving um, from a heavily linguistic. Um, literary position to a more visually driven position. Um, he also shows, um, you know, Bathis also shows us that, um, you know, he's, he's moving from a sort of a structuralist position, uh, if you are familiar with the um, ideas of structuralism, 
um, proposed by um, you know anthropologist Levi Strauss, Claude Levi Strauss, or um, which was heavily influenced by linguistic theorist of Saussure, uh, who has been inspiring Barthes's work, um, to a more post-structuralist one. So that is a journey that um, you know Barthes sort of um, has gone through from a, a purely structuralist sort of an idea to um, or to a post-structuralist. Um, uh, sort of an, uh, a scholarly journey. And, um, you know, the aspects of his, uh, you know, work that has been crucial to the development of semiotics also holds true for um, our study of images in this case. Um, the first of these um, is to locate the cultural context of the sign and signification. So, remember, he's talking about um, you know, something that is born in the text and then he is transitioning that idea to a level where we can borrow it to understand images. So, first of, I mean, he's talking about signs, he's talking about um, signification and, um, you know, he is, I mean, scholars who have worked with images have tried to take that uh, idea to a level of studying images with the idea of sign and signification. So, um, you know, this idea is that meaning can only ever operate within a social structure and that is, you know, the, the foundation, the principle um, of this argument is that, you know, meanings that we attach to images, meanings that we attach to signs, meanings that we attach to um, boundaries. Um, they can only operate within, embedded within social structures. They are not operating in vacuum, they are not operating beyond social uh, structures. They are, you know, operating embedded within a social structure. And um, all signification emerge from and return to culture. So, the idea of culture, the cultural, you know, the evolution of culture, is heavily driven by this idea of signification. So, what is signification? Signification, in a way, is sort of the symbolic meanings, um, you know, we attach to signs. And, um, you know, these are, this can range from, you know, macro, micro, meso, we can, can be of any scale. Um, and, you know, the idea that significations, all significations would emerge from and return to culture. So, these are the two very important components um, in Bath's uh, work that, um, you know, scholars dealing with images um, find very helpful that, um, you know, um, the idea that, uh, you know, meanings operate within deep social structures. And um, this second part, uh, which is also important um, in this uh, in this uh, area, is that um, in terms of the idea of the reader or the spectator as the creative part of the text. So what Barthes would uh, talk about is that you know the reader, the reader or the spectator who's reading the text, is the creator of sort of the interpretation of the text. And so, the creative part of the text lies in the readership. And so, that, um, you know, if you take it to the level of, um, you know, understanding image, that is what is going to be helpful for us, for you, for us, um, you know, to uh, understand images um, using bodies. So, we are again going back to um, some of the, uh, um, you know, fundamental principles of understanding what social structures are and, uh, you know, what um, sort of processes of signification do we um, undergo to make meaning of science um, and, you know, how cultural evolutions um, take place. So, um, so then um, if we have to, uh, you know, trace the journey of um, Barthes's idea from text to image and then to visual culture. Um, so, um, you know, the questions, again, um, scholars ask this question that, that would resonate with Barthes's work here is that, 
you know, how are images formed then, you know, what are the effects, what are the dynamism that's going on behind creating uh, an image and then not just creating an image, um, you know, how are images read, you know, who reads the image and what types of images are read and, you know, what is the sort of um, demographic composition of the people who are, who are reading the image. Um, I, I would deal with these uh, classifications a little more in my lecture on intersectionality and images, but um, you know, your social location, you as a person, you as a human being um, is already embedded within a power geometry and that power geometry is your social location. So your social location is influencing the way you would read or not read an image. And this is, um, you know, coming from Barthes's ideas and, and it's also coming from the gender geographies of power, the framework um, that I talked about um, in the introductory lecture. Um, but the point here for Barthes is that, um, you know, how an image is read within the parameters of a visual cultures. And how does an image become an integral part of visual culture? So, you know, that is again going back to Foucault, uh, you know, the power negotiation that is, um, that is found between the, uh, the viewed, the object and the spectator um, is probably, you know, making meaning to, um, to attach um, viewership to a larger visual culture. So, um, this is the relationship um, that we need to look at between spectator, culture and um, image. Um, so, if you are familiar with the discipline of um, visual culture and visual theory, um, they are concerned with analyzing the image, uh, not as a single component of course, um, but instead an image as a concept operating within and from a wide range of sources. So an image um, is not just an entity, of course there's a lot of um, you know, ideas that go, um, the lot of practices, a lot of geometries that um, influence the type of images that are um, produced. Um, and so, um, you know, this approach will, will possibly help you thinking about image um, as looking beyond the capacity of simple representation. So, we have dealt with the idea of representation. Um, and, you know, to look beyond what the image is representing is possibly going to give you the, um, the, the truer, a more critical analysis of the existence or the function of the image. Um, and, you know, when we think of this, so, you know, we also have to think of new concepts of images that can emerge uh, you know, and help in critical modes of um, interpretation. So, um, now that is, uh, you know, Barthes uh, ideas of uh, you know, the journey from text to image to visual culture. Now, there's a, a couple more important points that Barthes um, make uh, in his work and that is important for us um, in this regard. The first is the idea of semiotics of image and its narrative structure. And, um, you know, when we talk of the semiotics part, when we talk of the, you know, meanings and significations, uh, the signs and signification uh, process um, of images, um, you know, it is, it is also necessary for us to adopt a fluid lens that, you know, we are in the process of signification, you know, we may be restructuring the ideas of, um, you know, um, the image. And, you know, when, if you, if you go back to the original ideas of Barthes, you would see that, um, you know, uh, his, his work would probably translate into that, you know, all all images would essentially start with a blank canvas that you, you, you paint an image or you have an image on a blank 
um, canvas, literally a blank page. Um, and so, um, metaphorically or uh, otherwise, um, you know, as an empty social space. So, within an empty social space, the, the, the uh, you know, formation of an image um, is heavily influenced by social cultural discourses, is heavily influenced by social structures. And that is in a way also, um, you know, sort of influencing the narrative structure of um, the image. And that is uh, the narrative structure that is meaningful, that is heavily influenced by, um, you know, social, social cultural discourses or, um, you know, the social uh, structural setting where uh, the image is born. So, um, um, cultural narratives have, a, you know, a huge role to play behind uh, the creation and the dynamics of images. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, these systems and structures, um, they create and sustain the sociocultural discourses. So, uh, narratives also play, uh, you know, an important role. So, I come to a conclusion of uh, this lecture with the idea that, um, you know, many scholars have actually uh, talked about and um, again borrowing from a fifth scholar in this regard, um, image as a rhizome. And if you are familiar with Deleuze and Guterres work on the rhizome, um, you know, you would know that they are talking about, um, you know, aspects of heterogeneity and multiplicity. Um, and, and this is Deleuze and Guterri talking about rhizome that at any point, what is a rhizome? At any point in a rhizome um, can be, can any point on a rhizome can be connected with any other and must be. This is very different from a tree or a root which fixes a point and thus an order. So, the idea of multiplicity and interconnectedness, the idea of heterogeneity and interconnectedness, the idea of networked sort of an image is something, uh, you know, that we need to keep in mind. Um, and according to Deleuze Guattari, a rhizome never ceases to connect the chain. So, a rhizome is constantly connected, um, you know, with uh, at least one part of the component. So, um, in conclusion, um, I want to um, leave you with this idea of, um, of the component of an image that we have not really talked about in this lecture. So, this is something for you to think about is the invisibility of the image. What is the matrices of ideas or a matrix of ideas that renders an image invisible? And this is on this note, I would like to um, conclude this lecture and I would welcome you to go and read more about the scholars, the critical thinkers that we have discussed today. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed 
Shakespeare as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvellous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.